Next on Viewpoint, a successful fashion photographer leaves the industry to tell the story of Jesus in a new way through pictures. He'll share the struggles of getting his book published. Author photographer Michael Bell joins Bob today next on Viewpoint. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. What happens when you combine the most visual stories of the Bible with one of today's best fashion photographers? Well, this is the result. What you're looking at are photographs from Michael Belk. His breathtaking book, Journeys with the Messiah, may shatter some of your preconceived ideas of who Jesus was and is today. And Michael joins us today from his home in Florida. Michael, great to have you with us. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me on your show. I really want to get to your personal story and your personal investment in this whole project, Journeys with the Messiah. But first, let's take a look at one of the photographs to start with, just to whet your appetite. And this one's called Quandary. And Michael, give me, give me your, your view of, this, of how this thing, whole, whole thing took place, how it came together. Well, you know, Quandary is the story of the rich young ruler. Um, we just took a different angle on it. So uh, what, what we're doing here is, is we're having a first century backdrop with an actor as a first century Jesus. And then we're bringing the 20th, 21st century into the, into the set so that, uh, you know, you immediately look at the image and you know something, something's out of whack. So when we decided to do this uh, and we wanted to tell the, the idea behind the, the story of the rich young ruler, we thought, okay, well, let's have him be a really rich young ruler. He drives a Ferrari. He's got a good-looking good looking babe, you know, Rolex watch, Louis Vuitton luggage, you know, all of that stuff. So that's how we, that's how we pulled that one together. And the, the story there, I mean, when you see Jesus in, into, a, into a modern situation like this, and the question for the rich young ruler uh, in, in the Bible is, uh, he's saying, well, what do I need to, to do to inherit inter eternal life? Exactly, exactly. And that's what the story's about. But we're taking a little bit of a slant there because uh, for most people, the story of the rich young ruler is not a, about incredible wealth. It was in the case of, of, the, of the biblical story. But what we wanted to point out is that everyone has things that are holding them back from achieving that relationship with Jesus Christ. So in the case of the rich young ruler, as we know it, the biblical story uh, Jesus wasn't telling him uh, to sell everything and give it. He wasn't telling us to sell everything and give it to the poor that, you know, nobody have any money to give to the church or anything after that. But this was the rich young ruler's particular thing that was holding him back from from the dream of following Jesus into eternity. And Jesus, you know, had to kind of hit him hard with that and say, you know, let's get rid of the Ferrari and the Rolex and the Louis Vuitton luggage, sell it, sell it all, give the money to the poor and then come follow me. And I, I wanted to start with that particular image because it, it, it's not exactly your story, but it's the same question Christ asked you at one time. You guys started this whole, this whole industry, the whole photography thing, uh, selling clothes as a, as a teenager coming out of high school, right? Yeah, yeah. I started working uh, for a guy named Augie Griner back in high school and fell in love with fashion uh, and continued to work in in the fashion industry through my college days. And then um, part of God's plan looking back was that I was gonna go to work for kind of the pre-runner of, of uh, Polo, a company called Gantt Shirtmakers in New York, a job that was, uh, you know, a job that was for a seasoned veteran, not for a 22 uh, year old kid. And, uh, but I got hired and, and, you know, for a short time, I thought I sat at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and then I figured out it was just a job. <laughs> so, but, uh, so I continued, you know, there and uh, as an amateur photographer came up with an idea of how I could better promote the sale of my own line by using photography. Odd that a lot of that was not being done and it was so successful, I decided I would, uh, take it a step further and, and uh, quit my job and go to New York and do this for other companies. Do the whole fashion. And you, and you worked, I mean, you, you did work with, with Vogue and, and Elle and uh, GQ. We and didn't shoot for magazines. We shot for clients and put them in magazines. So, you know, Vogue, uh, GQ, Elle, Vanity Fair, uh, Ritz Carlton, Departures Magazine, all of them. And that led to, you know, a lot of fun as well because those, those people have you know, big entertainment budgets. But there, there had to come a time when you said, what, what's it all about? And uh, 
there's, there was a real impactful time that God asked you the same thing. What are you going to do with all this? You know, if you're going to work, you can't come up with, you know, too much better a job than being a fashion photographer and, and uh, you know, traveling to beautiful places and photographing beautiful people. And you're getting paid well and so forth. But I kept watching people and I'm saying, why, why me? Why do I get to enjoy this fantastic lifestyle? And that guy over there, you know, doesn't have enough money to have something to eat. Uh, you know, is there something expected of me? But I kept, I think I was having this silent prayer, just asking, asking God, I said, I know you expected more of me. You know, what is that? And so that silent prayer went on for a long time till he decided he would answer that. And then, then, then how did he answer that? I mean, at, the, at some point in time, you said, I've got this career. What's he really calling me to do? And how did all that, that vision take place? How did it foment in your mind and in your spirit to, to do what we see today in, in Journeys with Messiah? Yeah, well, if I was God talking to you, it would have sounded like this. It would have said, well, Belk, you are, you're just so hard-headed to get your attention I'm going to have to pull the rug out from under you and take you down. And uh, that's what he did. Uh, just out of the blue, uh, unexpected, just an event in my life just took me into a downward spiral. I crashed and burned and went into a very dark abyss. Um, it was, uh, yeah, I sometimes wonder if I just went to hell during that time. It was, it was the most, it was, it was frightening. It was dark. It was, uh, panicky. It was lost. It was, there's absolutely no way out. And I think when I reached that, that point that I realized I can't get out of this. Where does God appear in all of that? Well, he showed up in my bedroom one night and I can't tell you that I saw God, but I can tell you for sure that the presence of God was in my room and um, I likened it to a casual conversation of a neighbor dropping by for coffee. And I admitted to him that night that I just didn't have a clue. And if, and if he would show me his way, uh, I'd certainly like to give it a try. And you, you mentioned in the book that you want this uh, Journeys with the Messiah to give people a fresh perspective, especially if they don't know Christ, a fresh perspective not only of who he was, but who he is today. And if you would have seen these photographs in your pre-Christian days and in, in the time before this, uh, do you think they would have affected you? How, how would they have affected you at that time? Well, that's a, that's a great question, Bob. Uh, I've never had that asked before. Um, I think they would have impacted me because, you know, I was around people who were, were Christians and, and living the Christian walk, and they were always telling me I needed Jesus in my life. They just couldn't explain why. Um, but I would, get, I would engage them in conversation, and I didn't have the answer, but I kept saying, I just think you got it all wrong. I, I think it's a beautiful story, and I think it's a story of love, and, and, and it's just become this religious thing. You know, these images kind of re reflect, <clears throat> you know, a, a different view, and, uh, and, it, and we tried to do them and not be religious in them. Well, the, the book itself, I mean, it's certainly not a religious book. Matter of fact, it's not even sold in, in Christian bookstores, but it's not a religious book. It's a book about a relationship and, and how Christ relates to all of these modern day situations. One of the, the favorites is one called Compassion, and I think it can, can speak to anyone, but, but tell me how the, the whole process came about to, to shoot this particular shot. So when I had this this idea laid on me. It took me four years before I actually moved on it. But during that time, there were there were many things going on. One was I I was invited to this uh, uh, <clears throat> weekend retreat, and uh, when I showed up, everybody had gone off to play golf and stuff. And there was this guy there named ne Neb Hayden who was a, a religious scholar. So he wrote this book called uh, Seeing the Gospels Through the Eyes of a First Century Jew that we miss a lot of stuff. And he told me about the woman at the well that we get this idea that she was somehow a woman of ill repute or certainly one with many, many partners, maybe a prostitute. And he said, but, but according to what my research uh, shows, she wouldn't have been a prostitute. She would have most likely have been a woman who couldn't have children. She was barren. And so the story goes, she gets married she can't have children, which was vitally important. 
And a good reason to be given a divorce in those days, the divorcer should get married again. That guy would find out. And this went on through five husbands. Now she's living with a guy that she's not married to and she can't make any demands on him. Uh, so if she didn't have her father's home to return to, who knows, she could have become a prostitute. So uh, Jesus, when you see this image, well, in the story, but when you see this image, he approaches her from a point of view of compassion, whereas we who are reading that story often uh, you know, approach her from, from a judgmental side. And then you look back through Jesus' stories, and he was always compassionate. And so as Christians, if we're not compassionate with people, how do we how do we go about telling Jesus' story to them, you know? Well, I want to get back to some more of those photos as soon as we can. We're going to take a short break, though, because there's a lot of backstory to each one of these photographs. So we're going to take a break. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back. Journeys with the Messiah. We're talking with both the photographer and the author and the, the visionary behind all of this, Michael Belk. And Michael, we want to get to some of the images and I want to get to the backstory of a lot of these and how God showed up in so many of these shots and how he showed up in your life personally. But let's take a look at this one. It's called A Step Away. And this is an extremely interesting photograph. All of these images, Bob, began with a message. And so A Step Away, I wanted to show the divide that has occurred between man and God, and that uh, that no one is without sin, that everyone has been divided from God by their sin because God is holy and we're not. So in this image was to show these two groups of people, uh, one that you thought were the good guys and one that you thought were the bad guys, to show that that's not necessarily the case that we're, we're all divided from God by, by, you know, by the nature of sin. And we, we look at these images and we look at your career as a fashion photographer and think, well, that's an easy transition to, to go into something like this. And this wasn't some corporately funded project. Tell me how God showed up in all this and how you, how you worked your way through this personal commitment. As I was about to turn 60, I sat down with my wife, Cheryl, and I said, what if I die next year and I haven't done this? What happens when I go to heaven and face God, and he says, how come you didn't do this project I gave you? And he says, you know, I've given you the talent, I've given you the resources, you know, I've given you everything, I've trained you up in this for 30 years, <laughs> well, why didn't you do it? And I said, I, you know, I'd really like to go in more to an applause than that. So we decided we'd put my fashion career on hold for just a year, and, uh, and we would invest, you know, up to $100,000, you know, to do this. When I was in Italy in August, prepping for the shoot, and the new producer, who was phenomenal, Maurizio Antonini, uh, you know, after we met a couple of days later, he says, you can't do this for the amount of money you've set aside. And I said, what, what are we talking about? And he said, triple that. Wow. So, you know, now we're committed to spend $300,000 just to do the shoot part, okay? Just, just to create the images. And... Uh, we go to, to, to Italy then in October and the stock market crashes. The last thing that happened was about, I guess about five years ago, uh, maybe six years ago, the last thing we sold was our personal home at a, at a massive loss. And, uh, and we lost it all, you know. Um, that was a painful, incredibly painful experience, but God's given us many years to understand the necessity of stripping us of our own self-sufficiency. Because we were telling everybody, this was our money. Our money we invested in this. We put our money in this. And one day God showed me, no, it was my money. <laughs> and you almost squandered it too. <laughs> one of my favorite images, and I want to get to that one, is the Last Supper scene. But tell yeah. me the story behind this, because it's a dynamic story of how God not only showed up in the shoot, but made an impact in, in part of the cast life. I knew the story of Jesus telling his disciples, you know, this is, this is my body and this is my blood, but I just didn't understand the story, really. 
that this related to the Old Testament, the Passover lamb. God tells the Israelites if they put the blood of a Passover lamb or the blood of, of, a, uh, of a lamb over the doorpost of their home, and this had to be an unblemished lamb, which was considered to be such a great sacrifice, that if you put the blood of the unblemished lamb, the angel of death would recognize that home as one of God's people, and he would pass over and spare that child. And I said, oh, geez, people need to know this story. How are we going to tell that? So we decided to switch out Jesus with a live lamb at the table. That's brave. That requires a miracle, that requires a miracle Bob. <laughs> Tell me about the miracle, because I saw this in video, and my wife and I just love it. Yeah, yeah, so, so you know, so we had the whole idea, you know, and, and uh, so the trainer brought the, uh, brought the lamb in, and that was the first time it dawned on me, how are we going to get a lamb to sit still at a table? So the Christian part of the crew, we got together and we prayed. And we just said, God, we hate to put you on the spot, but we actually need a miracle <laughs> right now. We need this lamb to sit still while we do this photograph because we were doing one second exposures because of the way we were lighting it. And uh, when they put the they, when they put the lamb in there, they put his feet feet they put an apple crate in there and blankets, and they set him up, and he put his hooves, put it right on the table. And in, in retrospect, I think God put him in a trance because the lamb just sat there and stared at me for 20 frames in a row without moving. And I love to tell the story that the disciples moved more than the uh, lamb did. And it was just it was just an amazing moment because this was impossible. And yet in prayer, we ask God, would you mind doing a miracle for us, and then we saw it. And when you see a miracle occur, it's going to change you. When the trainer was walking out, my camera guy and producer stopped him and said, give Michael the lamb. And so they handed me the lamb. And if you have never held a lamb, it's better than a puppy. Uh, I mean, they're amazing. But uh, they said, look at the camera and tell us what happened here tonight. And I got about three words out and just fell apart. Another great image that, that I really loved was RSVP. And uh, tell me the backstory to that because it's a very interesting photograph. Uh, so, you know, you get these invitations and they say RSVP. And, uh, and I won't even try and pronounce the French phrase of that, but, uh, but it means, you know, you know, I can't, you know, I, I regret that I can't come. And so in the, in the story, the, the banquet man has um, invited many guests. And when it comes time for the party, they start offering really lame excuses as to why they can't attend the party. And as you know, in the scripture, you know, the guy sends his people into the street. He gets mad. He says, on the street, he says, I want to invite everybody, the blind, the lame, and the poor. And then he says something that to me is one of the most powerful statements in the gospel. He said, none of those who were invited will ever taste of my great feast. And when I understood that story, that, that, that Jesus is throwing the greatest party that will ever be given a life and eternity with him, and that the invitation's been extended to all of us, but there will come a time in which the gates to the party will be closed and it will be too late to enter if you haven't accepted that invitation. So we've got to show this, you know. So, you know, what we did is uh, uh, we, we hired a company to, our producer hired a company, a catering company to come in and set up the banquet with a beautiful table with the candelabra and the china. And then we had the first century people sitting with Jesus having a great time. And then in the background, we, we set up a balustrade across there as, the, as that divider between, between those who have accepted the invitation to heaven and those who haven't. And we've got all of those people first century, and they're dressed in tuxedos and evening gowns and stuff. We're talking hours to, to set this up and light it. And we started it, we started at maybe 2 o'clock in the afternoon to shoot this at night.
you know. And it's got tons of movie lights and so forth. And um, it just, it just, you know, I would love to take credit for the photographs, Bob. I can't. These are so far above my pay grade. This was God from the beginning. Only God could create something like this. Uh, and I just look at that picture. I have that picture here in my home. And I just look at it in total amazement of what he created that night. And when you look at these photographs, you've got a lot of personal investment. I mean, just what God was telling you throughout this whole story. And one of those is, is uh, uh, daily bread because it, it impacted you personally because it just taught you a lesson again about God's, uh, God's supply. Yeah, yeah. When, uh, when I was you know, working on, on this, so originally I had a few ideas and then when we decided we're going to do it, I really had to spend a lot of, lot of time listening. And I was reading in John where the disciples had asked Jesus to pray and he was showing them the form of prayer, which has become a corporate prayer for us today, but the form of prayer and the different parts of it, but the one, give us day by day the amount of bread we need. So, you know, I, I realized that um, I wanted my bread now, <laughs> you know. And, yeah, I was sitting there and said, I, I want my bread now. Uh, I want lots of bread. I want retirement bread. I want enough bread to do this photo shoot the way I, I did it. And then when the stock market, uh, you know, crashed as we were going to Italy, um, I realized I was going to have to depend on God's provision and that I had to allow him to supply that bread. So uh, I didn't even have that shot planned when I left to go to the shoot. And I got there and I told the crew, I said, I'm adding a, I'm adding a shot. I don't know where we're going to do it, what it's going to look like or anything else. Uh, a guy named Kim Dawson, who was part of the American crew, a great, great producer, uh, did the Ninja Turtle stuff and all that. And, uh, Kim came and he said, hey, you got you to gotta come see what I, what I found. And, and we went in, it was this 12th century courtyard of a cathedral. And we, we put it together and then, I couldn't figure out really what to do with the loaves of bread. And at one point I just turned to the turned to our modern day guy and I said, Hey, I want you to do this. I just want you to pick up all this all the loaves of bread, all seven loaves of bread, and walk away. And then I went over to Sergio, who was our Jesus actor, and I said, So if you're Jesus and you're sitting there and a guy walks off with all the loaves of bread, what are you gonna do? And he said, Well, I'd probably laugh at him. And I said, Well, great, let's laugh at him. And we put the shot together and started shooting Jesus laughing at this guy walking. So, so it's, it's just so typical of us. You know, we want to hoard the bread and Jesus is laughing at us. And in that, in that photo, Jesus is laughing at the man walking away. And, and some people get offended by, by humanizing Jesus that much. Uh, do you get any cr critical uh, re uh, you know, feedback on, on shots like that? The, I received a coffee table book uh, back you know, Journey's coffee table book, you know, back in the mail. And uh, there was no note in it uh, other than the person's address. Um, didn't seem to be anything wrong with it. So I looked up her order and I said, could you tell me what the problem is? And she very bluntly said, yeah, that, that one daily bread. I just didn't like, like seeing Jesus laughing. And I said, yeah, okay. You know, uh, and so that is quite a statement because maybe in many ways the church hasn't presented the human side of Jesus. You know, Jesus laughed. He was 100% human as well as 100% God. You know, he laughed. Uh, they probably sat around and told jokes, probably not the ones I've told in my life, but, um, you know, it's the human part of Jesus. He, he was here with us. To close this out, Michael, I want to give you a choice because there's people out there that this, this really rings with them about just giving what, they, what God's given them, give it back to him and, and let him work with it. There's two images, and, and one is vacancy, and the other one is all in. And I'm going to let you close with, with one of the stories about one of those shots because they're both, uh, they both impact people and their commitment to Christ. 
Well, thanks. The Winning Hand, the one you're talking about, All In, the Winning Hand was created. Uh, that's the group of guys, you know, sitting around the sitting around the table in tuxedos. But you might notice that one guy sitting at the table is in first century. Okay. And the idea, and I'm going to come back to that in a second, but the idea was to say we don't get to choose the hands that were dealt in life. We get to choose how to play them. And if we're not turning to Jesus in helping us play our hands, that's when we start gambling with our lives. And we might as well fold, okay? But recently, I was watching uh, a James Bond kind of show and the guys are in the in the casino, sitting around in their tuxedos. And one guy takes his whole stack and he shoves it forward with the classic "I'm all in," meaning I'm betting everything I got on that. And I paused that television program and stared at it and said out loud, "God, am I all in? I don't believe I am. I believe I want to be all in, but..." I really am not, I haven't gone all in, and I need, I need to go, go all in. So I started just, you know, looking at that whole idea and saying, do we believe that Jesus Christ is the winning hand? And are we willing to go all in knowing that with him we cannot lose? It's impossible to lose. And, and, and so, uh, so now when I do a presentation, I close with that image because it's, it's just such a powerful message. Are you all in? Are you willing to go in with the one who never loses? And, uh, and that's what that one's about. Beautiful image. Uh, Michael, that's a beautiful story as well. It's a great invitation to close this segment out. I really appreciate that. If people want to find out more about the book, where can, where can they go right now? Uh, they can go to our website, journeyswiththemessiah.org. Uh, we've got, you know, the books and the DVDs, posters, fine art pieces, and uh, the new film series soon to come. I want to thank Michael again for being with us today on Viewpoint. And if you want more information on how to obtain a copy of Journeys with the Messiah, either the smaller book, the abridged book, or the coffee table book, uh, you can uh, go to journeyswiththemessiah.org. Michael also speaks in churches, makes video presentations. There's uh, DVDs available. If you want any of that information, go to the website, journeyswiththemessiah.org.